Welcome to Heart and Hand, the Rangers podcast, the podcast that's as entertaining as the second half at Ibrox on Saturday. This week on Heart and Hand, we've seen this film before. So welcome to Art Hand, the Rangers podcast. My name is David Edgar. I am your host and I'm joined this week by our tactics squad, Mr. Adam Thornton. Hello, Adam. Hello, David. How are you doing? Uh, no, I, I suppose as OK as you can be on a Monday after a weekend like that. Uh, yeah. It, it wasn't the, the most thrilling game and unfortunately has, I think, cast a bit of a pall over the support. Now, you know, loads to get into loads to break down, but uh, Adam is our tactics guy. Uh, if you're on our Patreon site, you'll know he hosts the excellent tactics talk, which breaks down Rangers games into what we're doing, why we did it, why it's working, why it isn't working, etc. So he's the very man to speak to because I have read a lot from fellow Rangers fans and they've been in contact with me and they're saying, you know, why does this keep happening and why to the layman? And I would absolutely class myself in that regard when it comes to tactics. Why do we appear to struggle so badly against packed defences? But, you know, I think we can understand that that can happen. But it does appear that we tend to take the same tactics to play them each time. And there's not an awful lot of change. And by that, I don't necessarily just mean formations because on Saturday, for instance, Rangers changed a couple of times. We went started with our 4-3-3 went eventually with a 4-2-3-1, a, a and then by the end it was pretty much a 4-4-2. So, I mean, the system did change, but the tactic appeared very much get the ball wide, try and get crosses into the box. And we've seen that before, I think most notably against um, Aberdeen in the two defeats against uh, Dundee in the 1-1 draw away. And it, it doesn't seem to work in matches where... There were time, a lot of times where St. Johnson, and I mean, this is to their credit from a defensive point of view, St. Johnson would have 10 men in their own box in, in two lines of five. So what are your thoughts, first of all, on whether that's a legit criticism, you know, that, that we do seem to rely very much on this this tactic of, of trying to find our wide men, be it our fullback or our, uh, or our wingers, and get the ball into the cross? And secondly, why, if you think that that's legit. Why do you think we persist with it? Oh, the latter one is a, is a is a huge question. I don't think I've got the answer to, but but certainly the former, yes, I would say that's that's my view as well. I, I do think in in this game specifically, just after half time, we started to get a bit of joy in terms of breaking them down, but the changes uh, that were made kind of put us off balance as as they tend to do, and it resulted very quickly to pretty similar to what we've seen against Kilmarnock um, last midweek, eh, last weekend, sorry, which was kind of lumping the ball up kind of haphazard but but I think you're right on in the main we knew what St Johnson were going to do they came they didn't give us any surprises they they did what they would set out to do it's what Kilmarnock did it's what Dundee did it's what St Mirren did against us at Paisley we know this um yet the fact remains rightly or wrongly or or why but Gerard has a set up to be a counter-attacking team. Now, I've said this before on the flagship and, and every week on my own show, pretty much, so sorry for, for boring everyone, but it, it keeps happening, so I'm going to keep saying it. I, I don't understand why we're set up in that way. Um, we're set up to break at pace and whip balls into the box, yet the fact remains in 75, 80% of our games, teams are going to sit in and let us play in front of them. How are you supposed to counter-attack that? I don't understand what the approach is from the from the management team. Um, I, that's not going to work. We're going to get what we got on, on Saturday. We're going to get sideways passes. We're going to get going back the way. You see these, things, as you said, David, the single attack every time. Ball out wide, whipped in, corner, header, goal kick. We don't play any combinations through the middle. There's no... This is a bit of a bigger question I'm interested to get your thoughts on. I can't see a discernible style of play as far as I can see. David, you look at Guardiola and you think he plays possession football. You look at Klopp and it's gig and pressing. You look at other teams like Simeone and it's a 4-4-2 low block designed to counter-attack teams. Same with Leicester. We don't have an identity. Um, we pretty much go 
game to game and even I'll take that further even we go one attack at a time to be honest there's no logic there's no suffocating teams in penning teams into their box trying different things we pretty much just do that get the ball wide cross it header goal or goal kick or corner uh, and we'll try it again there's no logic to it there's no pattern um I'm not sure why. I'm not sure if it's just a we're Rangers, we need to win at all costs, therefore let's just get the job done. But I have to say, I'm nowhere near the level of asking serious questions about the manager, but it's interesting to me that he hasn't implemented anything like that yet. Yeah, I I don't... I think back to to times like um, McLeish, for example to the end of his reign, where I genuinely couldn't see what the plan was. And I can kind of see what the plan is here. Whether or not it's effective, that's the question for debate. And just because you can see it doesn't always mean it is effective. I could see what Warburton's plan was. I just didn't think it would work. And evidence suggested that it it wouldn't. But you could see what it was. It didn't mean it was good. Whereas with the likes of Eck or Pedro, I couldn't see at all what they were trying to do. I don't in any way class myself as an expert here, Adam, right? And so therefore, if any of the people are listening are much more aware of tactics than I am, I do apologise for this. If I have to say, I have to say as well, neither, neither do I. I'm just, I'm just kind of calling out what I can see um, <laughs> but, after talking to Ali, but yeah. yeah well, well, my mind doesn't quite, uh, Ali's the coach who comes on uh, at, at Adam's show. Uh, what I think is that Currently, there's a style that's in vogue that's influenced an awful lot of young coaches. Um, the the for really to be wanky, the the post Cruyffian style of football best exemplified or, or tweaked in the modern age, of course, by Pep, which is now getting slightly tweaked. Um, you get things like gag and pressing, and you get things like maybe not quite the reliance on possession, but in lightning quick attacks, for example, and turnovers and whatnot. And I think there's an awful lot of young coaches, which, which Stephen Gerrard is one, and Michael Beale would count as one as well, who are heavily influenced by that. And it's not in itself a bad idea, and I think it's more the way that both you and I and most of the listeners would prefer to see football played anyway, which is why football, I think modern football is probably a lot more attacking than maybe it previously was, because the emphasis is on getting forward quickly and getting goals but I agree with your point about, is it that appropriate for us, given that we will face two banks of, of five quite often and that even more different to, to, to big teams in England that, it, you know, if you're Liverpool and you go away from home, teams are going to have a go because that's the mentality of English football, isn't it? We all remember the utter shock and disdain and the fact that it was a talking point about Benitez setting up like that at home in a match against Manchester City, yep. uh, even though it worked, because it's just not the done thing down there. Down there, you know, we you, you still expect Burnley to have a go at Liverpool, don't you, at Turf Moor? Yeah. Because that's culturally what they do. Up here, we don't have that. St Johnston can come to Ibrox and sit with Ted. This is not new. I mean, older Bears will remember even further back. I remember going to see Motherwell play Rangers at Ibrox under Tommy McLean. And I used to think that, how the hell can they get 12 defenders back there? Um, Because it it was so defensive. So it's not new. And it doesn't make for very entertaining spectacles. But it's within well within their rights to play the way they have to to try and get a result. I get that. Huge budget changes and whatnot. I, I, I totally under... Or differentials. I get it. I think as well, and this is something that struck me, not for the first time this season, but struck me on Saturday, because I was sitting watching with my dad. My dad used to have a point when Mark Hately was at Rangers, which was that Hately was so good that he could make a lot of bad play look good. And by that, what I mean is an aimless punt. You could pretty much, if you put it into his area, you could guarantee he would go up and compete for it and more often than not make something of it. And that certain players at Rangers regressed because of that, because the option was too easy and was always available to them. And that rather than taking the tougher decision, they knew they always had... We call it an out ball, but it becomes the ball, doesn't it? It, Yeah. An out ball suggests it's the last thing you do whereas instead it became the first and there was a different version of the same thing if that makes sense when Gaza and Loudrup were there where players would just 
I can give it to one of them. You know, I, I don't need to take responsibility because I can just find them and they'll do something with it, even if they had two or three men on them. And I think Morelos does that for us. I yeah. think because you can play a ball that's a bit aimless, but into his area, that on Saturday he wasn't there, but players lapsed back into it and were hitting the same types of balls to Jermaine Defoe, which, of course, is, is never likely to get success and, of course, didn't. Whereas... People have said, oh, Jermaine Defoe can't play in that system. He can play in that system if the team changes and says, right, well, we can't play those balls. He's not going to be able to do much with them. What we need to do is get the ball quickly into midfield in the centre and try and play it through and play it in behind and, and rely on his movement and pace to get in behind the defence. Or once they do, as they did, because they did that in the first half, but once they retreat in, uh, into that, what you then have to do is, is I think, say, right, OK, what we need is is him moving and trying to move the defenders to create that bit of space and runners from midfield. But instead, we got lumped up balls or knocked out wide, knocked back inside, knocked out wide, knocked back inside, cross, and across from deep a lot, Adam. That was the other thing. It wasn't like we saw Tav, Barisic or the Wingers get to the byline a lot. Yep. And the only time I thought that we looked threatening was when Ken, who didn't have his best game, but he was trying to run at them centrally and work things and work one-twos um, and get the defence turning, you know, and, and get them facing up to him. I do understand where the manager's coming from when he says it doesn't matter or, or, or alludes, it doesn't matter what the tactics are if the players are playing so badly. And I get that. But equally... I do think that when you are allowing them, even when things are going well, to play in that quite simplistic fashion of a look for Alfie and not say to them, yeah, we've got Alfie, but he is a weapon. He's not the weapon. I think that now the players have sort of lapsed into that habit. And like I say, not for the first time I've seen it at Ibrox and it's happened at other teams all over the world when you have a very special player, but you really notice it when he's not there. It's not just about what he brings, it's what he allows other players to get away with, um, which is probably too harsh a term, but still. And I think that that's what happened to us on Saturday. I think you're absolutely spot on. He masks deficiencies in our build-up play. Mm. Um, we're, we're able to ha have Goldson and Worrell bring the ball out and ping it over the midfield and Morelos can fashion something or he can he can play Kent in or Candace and we kind of get past that that non-functioning midfield um we didn't have that on on Saturday obviously your your point there about I I, I kind of agree with you which which might seem quite strange I think formation is is important in a way but it's probably within that how you how you adopt that formation and, and how you play like you, you've seen for example we need to we need to attack more centrally. We know that we know that the balls that you play for for Morelos are going to be different to the balls that you play for Defoe. So so we need to have a, another way of playing. We can't just identify that's the number nine, that's the focal point. This is the way we play. We only play one way. This is what's happening. We play the same way we play away to Celtic as as we do at home to at home to Celtic as we do at home to to St Johnson. That's not going to work. You can't have Candias doing what he did against Celtic against St Johnson. He, he needs to be able to. Have a trick and beat a man. Uh, he's not really got that. He's he's a he's quite symptom. I've said this before to you, but he's quite symptomatic of this team for me. Um, he plays very very well in those big games on the counter. But oh yeah, yeah. Europe. He was great. I thought that was his best spell yeah. of run of matches, and and it's because it's a and logically, of course, you go well if he can do it against Rapid Vienna and he can do it against Celtic, he must be able to do it against St Johnston. But it's just a different challenge. It is, and it feels like it feels like he's got Gerard's got a four three three, and he knows what he wants from it. He wants a, a kind of inside winger on one side and a, and a right winger on the other side. He wants a focal point, and he kind of wants one, maybe two holding midfielders and a box to box in Scott Arfield, and he wants two flying fullbacks attacking pretty much at will. That's kind of what he wants. But when you don't have those players playing, as in that first team, whatever that might be, when you've got Halliday at left back, for example, and they try and play that same way. He's not quite got the athleticism, I guess, to get to get up and down. Maybe that's a bit hard, but he's also not maybe not got the the passing ability to be able to take the ball and turn on his left foot. It's, you see the same on the other side. I, I kind of agree that Jack looks better further forward sometimes. However, you play Jack and you play Stephen Davis, you might get a, you, you get a different player. So you should. 
treat the ball differently in those situations. You play Arfield or Ajari on the other side. It's a different player. You can't play the same kind of passes, expect them to do it. The same with Kent on wide left or Middleton. There's passes you play to Kent, you can't play to Middleton. You need to play them over the top for Middleton to run on. Same on the other side, but it just feels like we do the same thing over and over again, regardless of who's playing, and it is so frustrating. I think, as you've said, we're too one-dimensional. We play that get-the-ball-wide thing. Teams are more than happy to sit and head the ball away. You look at St. Johnson, what would they rather have? Well, they were huge. I mean, that was but, one of the biggest defences I've seen all season. Like you said, we play early balls to almost try and catch them off guard, but when there's 10 of them back there against the foe, that's not going to work. We need to try and cut them open and, and move them about. It just doesn't seem to be much variance in it we should for me personally if you're looking for a solution I don't I don't have one really but for me I think it needs to be trying to to get more creativity in, in that central, central midfield I know we've signed all these players and, and it doesn't look like any of them can really do that but for me it's something like pulling Ryan Kent into into a kind of not necessarily a number 10 but as the most advanced midfielder and and, and try and get him on the ball Get them. We desperately, desperately need somebody who can carry balls from deep. Um, whether that's Kent coming off the flanks, as he kind of tends to do, or whether he starts a little bit deeper, saying Arfield's position in a 4-3-3. When was the last time you seen that from one of our centre mids who picks up the ball on the halfway line and just runs at the defence? It doesn't happen. We don't do it. Arfield gets on the end of chances and he links up well at the edge of the box sometimes. But for me, we need someone who can take the ball centrally and and beat a man or two or, or at least beat their press and try and create spaces, try and create gaps. I would even go as far as, we've tried everything else, I'd even go as far as swapping Kent and Arfield, put Arfield out on that side, try and get him to occupy a defence on that side with Barisic overlapping him, try and get Kent in the middle. Um, we, we need to try other things because it, it's insanity kind of just, just doing the same thing. And you know, looking ahead to, to Wednesday, Morelos is back, okay, that's a that's our ace card that might go a little bit differently, but you know what Kelly are going to do. You know what the crowd are going to be like. We know it. Everybody listening to the podcast knows it. The manager knows it. It's really up to both player and players and manager to be able to find solutions to the same problems. Mm. And, and I do concede uh, absolutely that the players played badly and over and above any tactics. You know, it's if that happens, you're going to struggle. One of the things that, that has concerned me, and maybe I sound like a broken record, and apologies to regular listeners if, if that's the case, is tempo, Adam, and especially at home, the tempo with which we start, because an awful lot of matches a season that aren't what you would maybe consider the bigger ones, we have come out quite slowly, which has allowed uh, the opposition to settle in, if you like. And then, of course, build the frustration around the stadium. And that does have an effect. Uh, our, our podder, Alex Staff, I think is an excellent point about this Rangers team that it does seem to be affected by by a crowd. Um, and, that, you know, if the crowd are bang up for it, then that's tend to be with the players. But then I don't think that's unusual. I think that that crowd team relationship is quite symbiotic at most grounds, you know? Um, it, yeah. Obviously, that's the point of a crowd. And... I, we start in a sort of sluggish fashion and now because we've seen it so often, I think, and I, I felt at the game on Saturday that the crowd went on, oh, no, you know, it's one of these ones uh, and we're waiting for a bit of spark that doesn't come and it builds up the pressure and it almost becomes a, a, a kind of fait accompli that we start slowly, the crowd think, oh, we've started slowly. The players then go, oh, the crowd are on us and it just it's this horrible vicious circle that continues uh, and spins on I you know it's one of these things again that as just a fan you, you sometimes struggle with is what makes you come out some games and fly out the traps what makes certain teams able to come out and no matter who they're playing fly out the traps and what makes you at some matches just come out and look as though you've got seven or eight that aren't feeling it and that then creates its own issue. Uh, yeah, I agree with I agree with you um, on that one, and, and certainly Alex's point about the way that we react is is absolutely true. However, we can't expect the crowd to be all happy clappy all the time every time that the the players turn in a performance like they did on on Saturday. Um, they need to be able to rise above that as as professionals. I don't believe we've got an issue with player quality. I know I know quite a few people will disagree. I think we have the the makings of a decent squad there um, but we, we do seem to have more of an issue with consistency and, and, and more likely consistency and mentality for me we are capable on our day I think it was I think it might have been the, the daily update or, or the post match this week we're capable on our day of giving every team a good game 
Um, we're capable of turning up in big games, but we're not capable of consistency. Um, now, without being too harsh, that's what Hibs do. That's what Hearts do. If 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 Rangers or Celtic go to an away, if Rangers or Celtic go to an away game in Edinburgh, you know you're going to get a right good game. Equally, you know that Hearts will fling in a performance that they did yesterday and get beat two one off Motherwell. That, that's what a provincial team does. They they turn it on when it suits them. We've got great, we've got good players. We we absolutely do. We have the player quality there. It's it's for me. It's about consistency of performance and grinding out wins when you're not playing well and and having a trick in your in your locker. And for me, we we need to have more players that are able to take the game by the scruff of the neck. I'm not talking about leaders. I'm talking about players who lead by example of being better than the opposition and being brave on the ball and and. Taking the risky pass, you might get a couple of boos, but if you play that ball inside the fullback and somebody's got an easy tap in, you'll get all the praise in the world. It's just about taking those risks rather than continually shuttling it wide or shuttling it back and not wanting to take responsibility. I think that's the bigger issue for me. That's a really interesting point and one I want to expand on because I, I thought on Saturday that I get that. I, I, we all know that story and it doesn't just apply to Rangers. Players, a big club, are frightened to make a mistake because they think the crowd will get on them, so they go to a kind of safety first style of play, which is get the ball, want the extra touch, and then have to turn back and then play it back to the centre backs or you know the simple pass. And I know that that exists, but what struck me on Saturday was that the reason we're told players do that is that they're scared of if they play the risky forward ball that they might get you know you made a mistake and and, and cop it from the crowd, but they were copying it from the crowd for the safety first football. Yep. So. Is it a mentality thing then that you just say, right, you know, lads, if you're going to run the risk of it happening anyway, you might as well try the pass that is going to that is gonna lead to something if it comes off rather than just take the abuse anyway for something that isn't going to create, that you've no risk reward to. It's just you're going to get the crowd upset by it. This is where, this the, is where sorry, David, I just didn't drop, but this, this is where the, the Gerard thing for me is quite interesting because he's probably the single most British footballer of the last 20, 25 years that I would say was the shining beacon of what mentality is um, and also about taking risks and with those 40, 50 yard passes he plays all the time. It's quite interesting to see the juxtaposition of I can't quite imagine he's telling the team to go out there and, and play it safe um, and, and kind of sit back and, and wait for an opening that's never going to come because there's 10 men behind the ball so I'm interested in that and, and, and obviously we'll, we'll never really get the answers to it but I don't believe for a second he is going out there and, and telling the players to sit tight for the for the first half and, and wait till St Johnson tire and, and you might get in and, and keep doing it this way so I'm not sure where the disconnect is there and, and to be honest that's potentially a slight on him he said a couple of times now um, the players didn't do what I want them to do um, and it's I, I don't agree that it's throwing the players under the bus um, I think both sides need to take responsibility there. But if the players are not doing what you want them to do, then either you've got an, a, a mutiny situation on your hands, which I absolutely doubt very much, or there's an issue there with you passing the information and, and you're not communicating your ideas um, in the right way, or, or quite simply the players aren't capable of executing. Now, I don't think that's the case either. So but Yeah, because we saw that with Warburton, for example, that yeah. we knew what he wanted to do, but we all felt like, hang on a minute, they're just not up to that. They just they can't do it. They're trying, but they're just not good enough. Yeah, so it's, it's an interesting one. I, I honestly don't know what the answer is to that, because looking at the manager, looking at the way he played, which is all you can really go on. He does seem a bit more pragmatic as a, as a coach. I'll, I'll give him that, but I'm interested to know... What he was, what he's been telling them to do. He comes out and says they weren't doing what I asked them for. But I'm interested to know what what he means. Is it is it just the tempo and the pressing has been a little less, and he still wants us to play that counter attack, get the ball forward, or or are they not capable of playing possession football? I think it's probably the former. I don't think he wants to particularly play um, the kind of Pep Guardiola 80% possession type thing. Um, I, I think it's probably the former, but it's an interesting one. Now, uh, we, we saw a couple of players in the starting 11 on Saturday that obviously arrived in, in January, three players that arrived in January. Um, and again, this is just stuff that we either received into us on our Patreon site or uh, were, were sent to us on social media or we saw on message boards, for example. Uh, the first one we kind of touched on was Jermaine Defoe. And I think that we both agree it's not so much that 
Defoe didn't work or doesn't fit is just that we weren't playing to our strength. Something the manager alluded to, incidentally, where he said afterwards, you know, we've got an international number nine who craves chances and we weren't making him any. And there's an understanding there that he's not a Morelos battering ram that can go out wide and, you know, physically win the ball and then through skill, drive and pace and, and strength drive his way into the box. But the the one then that I think has, has taken a lot of criticism was Stephen Davis returned after not featuring much, I think just seven minutes at Kilmarnock in the last couple of matches. Um, he, he hadn't started that well in his opening couple of games and, and I think we understood why he was benched. He came in on Saturday and, and I thought that great, this is the ideal game for him. And he, he, he had a poor match and, and was gone after 60 minutes. And I think that there's a, uh, well, there is, you know, it's, it's noticeable, a lot of Rangers fans expressing concern that oh you know maybe we've been a bit guilty of thinking that we were getting back the Stephen Davis of of 2011 and that he's he's just not up to it now the counter argument is look he hasn't played much football he's clearly still finding his way back to form my take on it was that I didn't expect back the Stephen Davis of 2011 but I did expect at least the Stephen Davis of early 2018 and I accept he hadn't played much this season but he did play a lot last season so I'd, you know, I'd seen him within the last calendar year and he was a different player sure to when he was younger but he's a lot better than what he's showing are we being a little premature because something I've seen argued back when people say yeah he's finished is well hang on aren't you the type of guy that tells me we need to give Gresh the six month we need to give Barris the six month and, and uh, there is a bit of truth in that the other Counter argument, and this is why it's, it's as I say, it's such a quagmire. And it's why I'm I'm not quite sure where I stand on it yet because there's so many different factors. Is well, yeah, that's true, but they're permanent signings, and at the moment he's only here for six months. And you expect a player who's here for six months, or you need a player who's here for six months. Although we expect him to stay on if he does well, to have an immediate impact. What there's a lot of, as I say, there are points and counterpoints. What's your take on where Davis is and where he's where he can go. Um, he's only played ninety minutes once. Um, it was against Cowden Beath. Now I get that point. Oh, he's coming on loan. He needs to be. He, he he's only coming for twenty games really, and we've now seen him what six, seven times. Um, so he needs to be up to speed. But but realistically, he's played very very little football. Um, over the last eighteen months or so. Um, at, at an age where he probably needs to be playing to keep that level of fitness. So it's only natural to expect. Um that he would take a little bit longer than, than most to, to get up to speed. However, the phone Davis is something I've, I've been thinking about because I'm, I'm the same as you. I, I, I was quite happy with it. I, I thought it would mean a change in formation and we would get a clear run at, at playing um, players in more attacking central positions like, like like both of them should be able to offer. However, for one reason or not, um, Morelos being banned and, and various other reasons we've not quite managed to get that run um, so we've not really managed to get our strongest team out there with them playing however he has played less than I've thought um, uh, for example I thought I thought the game on Saturday Kilmarnock away was, was probably better for him um, than sorry it would have been a good game for him to come into to, to try and get on the ball and he looked okay in his little cameo but he was pretty poor on Saturday um, is there an argument for, for these that he was always a player for Davis who, who, who was capable of picking a pass, that's without a doubt, but he, he now plays a little bit deeper. We're not going to see him wide right, as we've seen, as you alluded to, 10 years ago, or even a box-to-box in support of the midfielders. He, he played a little bit deeper for, for Southampton. Uh, are we expecting him now to be kind of like... He's played that pseudo number 10 a couple of times at Cowden Beath, etc. That... I'm, I'm not quite sure that's that, that plays to his strengths. Um, there's a bit too much of back to goal and, and not able to kind of affect play from, from deep. Um, is he playing there because we never brought a number 10 in? Um, have we bought players that were available um, and we just tried to fit them into the team? Um, have we really thought about what we wanted to do there? Both of them were mooted in the summer, so you would have hoped that, that they were coming in with a, a clear plan of, of where to play them. But at the moment, it looks very much like we're just trying players game to game um, and we'll see what happens in this game. Um, despite a lack of creativity being the single biggest issue that, that we've identified in the team since the summer, are we expecting Davis to be that advanced midfielder? Is he even capable of doing that? 
just because he's a good passer. I'm not sure that's really fair. So I think it's a combination of him taking a bit longer to get up to speed, but I'm not really sure we're using him in the right way either. To me, he should be playing, if you're playing that 4-3-3, he should be that middle midfielder um, capable of dictating the tempo um, and playing those passes that we need to play into central areas, down the wings, cutting in the fullbacks, and and kind of getting the whip crosses over. I'm not sure we're seeing that, but I'm not sure if it's solely down to a lack of fitness. Mm. Yeah, well, you know, time time will tell. I, I'm still very confident on Defoe because I think he's shown already that if you make him chances, and you can't then say that that there's anything surprising about that fact that you need to make chances for Jermaine Defoe for him to be a success for you because yep. we knew that right so any club taking him on knew that so I, I still think he's more than capable of doing that for us if the other players in the team uh, react to that Davis is more interesting because there's a lot of unknown factors this is going to make your blood boil because you know as a modern day tactics fan that uh, the words 4-4 four, four, and 2 being put together um, I know, uh, and I do understand that there are certain matches. There's no chance at all you can play that. Um, but we've just mentioned and we've just spoken about for for twenty minutes or so that Rangers at home against certain teams face unique circumstances, and it made me think that football in Scotland I don't think has evolved massively since Walter was here. And one of the things he did effectively was a four four two, including Davis. And what he would do would on the right he would have Davis a midfielder, and on the left he would have a winger, a traditional winger. And what that allowed was you kind of had, admittedly, a halfway house, but it allowed you to have width on the one side and try that, but the other player cutting in and, if you like, almost adding an extra man into the midfield and the fullback on that side at the time, um, Hutton and then Whitaker to get forward. And it made me wonder if you could do something similar just in these games, or at least try it, where you have, as I say, the, the, the two up front, and maybe this is invalid when Maria Loss is available, but we've seen it in games even when he has been available. And you do that where you have Davis and he can come into midfield and become more central or, or trying to move more centrally because you've got a fullback behind him in Tav who can happily belt up and down into that space. On the left, you play Kent, who's your more traditional winger type, and then you play at fullback. If you want, you can play a Halliday in there because he doesn't, much in the way Papach did, doesn't have the responsibility of bombing up and down the, the flanks. Um, is this just hopelessly simplistic and anachronistic, or is there maybe worth a look at? As I say, with the understanding that you know you can't play it every week, you certainly can't play it against Celtic or Aberdeen at Pataudry or whatever, but you can utilise this because we do face this fairly unique challenge. Yeah, we've we've obviously seen that that kind of lopsided four four two more than once. I'm thinking obviously advocate did it with Reina, yeah. with Reina as well, and then even further back, we kind of did it with with Loudrop as the kind of floating. Um, if we played a four four two, yeah. So maybe something like that might be more. The, the midfield four was probably a bit more work, workmanlike under Smith the second time around, but maybe something like that if you think you've got two proper sitting the uh, two proper central midfielders in there, which might be an issue for us, um, and and someone else tucked in the right hand side, and then Kent, Kent just trying to find gaps um, anywhere, leaving space for Barisic to get forward, leaving space for Taft to get forward on the other side. It's, it's possible. I'm, I'm, like I said, I, I think we need to. It's, it's less about formation, I think, for me, and more about players taking responsibility and, and in those forward areas and, and decision making, which again comes from player quality. It absolutely does, but having the bravery to just make the pass that might not come off, but at least we the fans are. If you make a pass like that, that is a, is a decent effort. The fans appreciate that. They know. Yeah, if it's tr- narrowly you, cut out, yeah, yeah, you're right. People, oh, unlucky. That that's yeah. the reaction. Not for fuck's sake. Whereas, really, a, a sideways pass on the halfway line, um, like Warrell did against Kilmarnock, it's a lazy pass. First of all, um, it just kills us. Um, it's just that you can be hamstrung by a lack of bravery uh, as well as not wanting to do it, and it can cause issues as we've seen there. Um. Yeah, I also don't think we should, I really we've moved away from it now that that we're talking about the four four two diamond etc. But I don't think we should have discarded the the three five two. Uh, I know Andy, one of the other podders, is, is of the same opinion. I, I think you look at it and you think a oh, three five would do we really need three centre halves? But possibly not. Possibly we 
could live without that. However, if you have a three-five-two and say McCrory's one of the one of the centre halves, and name only, but he's stepping out to do that. Out, yeah. He's stepping out to do that destroyer role. It's essentially a a, a two-man defence. Um, but you've got the fullbacks positioned higher up as wing backs and you then try and flood the middle. The issue we've got is that we need, regardless of what we play in there, we need the players that are playing in the middle to take responsibility and, and play those passes. Any formation we're going to fall down as soon as we get to that 18 yard line or, or even 25 yards out, we're going to fall down unless we have players there who are capable of lifting their head up and playing a pass. It's kind of that simple for me. We can talk about formations and we can talk about this and that, but until we kind of change how we attack and our approach to attacking, I think we're going to fall into the same issues regardless of setup. Yep, I don't think anyone could argue with that. Um, we could talk about this stuff till we're blue in the face. You're right, though, if, if players... I do, I do. Yes, um, if uh, players will not step up to the mark and, and deliver, then yeah, you're right, there's... there's no tactical fiddling is going to make much of a difference. Moving on, then we have Kilmarnock at home in the Scottish Cup with the winner of Tipitodre for the quarterfinals. Um, so if we are to win the Scottish Cup this year, it's going to be a very, very difficult route to the final. But still, that's uh, if you want to win trophies. And we welcome back Alfredo Morelos, which I think we're all very, very glad about. But as you mentioned there, we know exactly what we're going to get from Kumar. Like Jesus, we've played them 109 times this season. Um, they're not going to change. They've had success against us doing that. Do you expect to see much different or can we assume that we'll probably just revert back to the 4-3-3, knowing that, that Alfie seems to thrive more as a lone attacker between two and hope that we just get a far better level of performance right across the board? So I think I think it it will be four three three. Yeah, I, I don't think they're obviously a, a slightly different proposition away than they are at, at rugby park, but they're still very very good on the counter. Um, they get wide and they get high and, and they do hit you. Um, the frustrating thing is that we're not good enough um, or, or mature enough as a team to play our own game in, in every game. Yep. Um, so I think we do need to adapt to certain teams as much as we probably don't like that kind of reality. I think we do. So I think. Kilmarnock is a different proposition to St Johnson in terms of how the team is set up, so this 4-3-3 I think is, is really what we need to do. Um, I guess the, the midfield is, is a a huge debate at the moment in terms of who would come in there. For me, um, McCrory would always start and I would be looking to try and keep getting Davis up to speed. Now, whether um, Arfield and Jack are, are injured still, I'm not sure. We'll need to wait for the press conference on that one. Um, I don't know, but I, I'm expecting us to I'm expecting us to do okay. I think I, I would imagine Kelly are going to do what they do and they're going to sit in and we're going to try and break them down. I would hope that after the two games that we've just had that the manager will, will have the players up for it and, and realistically this is our, our biggest chance of, of self-aware this year so I think this is a huge game and, and more often than not um, again that mentality of, of turning up for the big games we have done it this year um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll see a bit of a reaction. Absolutely, me too, and we, we desperately need to because obviously at the weekend it's now gone to eight points. It's a lot to try and claw back realistically. Um, I never, ever give up, but it's a lot, and I think that we would accept that the Scottish Cup is our best chance of, of picking up some silverware this season, even though, as, as mentioned, it would be very, very difficult. Now, Adam, um, an interview came out with Stuart Robertson on Monday uh, of Rangers in which he discussed the SFA disciplinary procedures and was very critical and I think in a, an interview that, that was warmly received by Rangers fans in which he suggested that he feels that there's very much a trial by sports scene uh, culture that goes on and that Rangers are treated differently by the BBC and to his point what he said was well the BBC admit they treat us differently because they they want to come to Ibrox and cover our games, but they don't want to talk to anyone from the club. They don't want to talk to our manager. Uh, they are in a dispute with us, and I think that was cleverly put, um, because we're not in a dispute with them. We just won't allow Chris McLaughlin and anybody else from the BBC as welcome. The BBC choose not to cover us. So he said, how can we then accept that they don't decide to cover us differently elsewhere, i.e. in sports scene and by their coverage? So... He also seemed to suggest that he feels that you can get away with certain things in one game, but not in another. And that over the course of this season, there are things being picked up 
that weren't being picked up previously despite no directions being given because normally if there's a change if they say right we're going to start penalising X the referees will get together with the players and managers at the start of the season they say that hasn't happened but we are seeing things that previously were fine are now suddenly not and it's a bit unfair because players don't have the opportunity to amend behaviours that as far as they were aware weren't negative so he has I think very much put our case forward and done quite well and Stuart Robertson takes criticism we've criticised them probably well again but I thought it was a very good interview and I do suspect that among Scottish football maybe not within the media obviously but within Scottish football there is this almost acceptance that we do have and it's a three word uh, quick way to say it shorthand but we do seem to have this trial by sports scene which does seem to suggest therefore that discipline or disciplinary action is a lottery and it just depends on whether or not you are unfortunate enough to be focused on by uh, the TV programme and by the rest of the media and that that will alert the compliance officer. What were your thoughts on the interview and the overall points it suggested? I thought it was I thought it was quite interesting I think it's it's said everything that, that I guess us as, as Rangers fans have been thinking and, and the points about the BBC are, are quite um, to the point, uh, I think he doesn't really mince his words. He, he, he says they are quite openly that the BBC aren't banned, um, but they're choosing not to come. And if they want to come, but not to interview the players and manager, which seems very, very strange from that sense. But he also goes on to talk about Morelos. And he talks about specific incidents, which is quite strange for for Stuart Robertson. It's always quite high level. Um, he doesn't really tend to get into the, the detail of it, but he, he talks about the Morelos incident, um, where where sports scene in particular spent an inordinate amount of time talking about the incident, but but didn't talk about other incidents which I in the game, which I assume um, he, he's talking about uh, Brown, Brown Stackle and Candace and then Callum McGregor's handball on the line, I would imagine. But then he says Morelos was, was vilified and he uses the words vilified for three weeks on, on various BBC platforms. Correct. So it's, but it's, so it's an interesting one there because he, he's raising a fair point. We're being treated differently by, by BBC um, in certain ways. So why would we assume we're not being treated differently in, in these ways as well? And you only have to look at the number of citations by the compliance officer to see that that's very much the case. There's a lot of interesting terminology he uses here. He's asked a question, can you explain how the process works? And he says, what would appear to happen is this. Surely they should be clear about exactly what is happening and, and, and why he goes on to say it's not clear what instances have been cited. As you mentioned, something one week gets cited that doesn't the other week because it doesn't appear on the sports scene. Is that the rule, really? Is that what we're going by? If sports scene set the agenda, then Clear White will pick it up. It, it seems very, very strange and he, he calls for going back to the way that they were before, um, which is off the ball incidents and violent conduct only that are being re-reviewed so that you're not refereeing games and you're not going back to every incident and examine it in minute detail rather than TV pundits setting the agenda on a Monday morning. So it's quite hard hitting from that point of view um, and it certainly was quite interesting. I couldn't really disagree with, with anything he said, to be honest. I have a friend who's a Hamilton fan. Uh, yeah, they, they do exist. And one of the things he said to me is, he said, if the BBC decide, if it's been a quiet weekend or if they decide that they need to look as though they have some interest in the Diddy clubs, that they'll pick out an incident from a Hamilton St Mirren match, for example, and they'll go on about it. He said, and the player will get cited. He said, whereas in the same incident could happen in another 10 of our matches, but doesn't even make the highlight cut, you know, because there's maybe been more goals in that match. So he's, this is not a unique feeling to Rangers fans about the compliance officer. And what worries me slightly is that you'll get that very self-serving logic that, that football people do, that, that you hear a lot, which is, ah, oh, well, if everyone's unhappy, it must mean they're doing a good job, yeah. which I've never quite understood. You know, if everyone hates a pundit, he must be very good at his job. No, uh, I don't think that's how it works. I think that it's now almost commonly believed that this happens. And the reason is Ockham's razor, it's because it happens. And that, I think, is an issue because how can you have a two-tier justice system? And we currently do have, we've got a random justice system, at which that's an oxymoron because by its very nature, a random system of justice cannot be justice. 
No, you're absolutely right. I, I, it appears to be a two-tier system. We've seen again again yesterday, Scott Brown, Kirk Broadfoot, fairly identical challenges. One gets a yellow card, one gets a red card. Um, you could say there's a, that argument of all, all evens itself out, but that's a couple of times that's happened to to Brown in the last couple of weeks. Three, I think, really, um, yeah. and, and nothing yeah. happened. So is Hibs in that one, yeah. Yeah, so you look at Ryan Jack last year against Aberdeen getting cited for tackles that aren't anywhere near as, as bad as, as any of those. So there's, it's only, you can talk about it being a, a witch hunt and a vendetta and you can say everybody's out to get Rangers, etc. But as Stuart Robertson says in, in that interview at the last point, he says it's important the, client officer, the compliant officer isn't influenced unduly by sports scene. All we ever want from the BBC in particular is to be treated fairly in a balanced way and in an accurate way. So I think that's true. That, that's very, very true. No one is saying that we should get less decisions against us if they're merited. However, some of them quite clearly haven't been. Um, and there are other issues that are being picked up across the league, as you said, that really it, it's just a, a complete cop-out. You look at the one, I can't remember who the referee was, David, in the Celtic Hibs game, but he, he claimed he didn't see um, he didn't see the full extent of the, the Hibs guys uh, sending off or, yeah. or should, have, should have been sending off. But Bobby Madden saying he, he didn't and he didn't see Alan McGregor's, but that's quite clearly a lie. Yes. I, yeah, yeah. How can how can that be allowed? How how can that be one man's opinion is is kind of taking his gospel in that respect? It, it, there really needs to be a fairer way to do that. You can't have the referee come back in and just say something to make himself get off with it or or not have culpability. It it, it can't happen. He talks about VAR as well and bringing in VAR. I think there's a, obviously a wider debate that we've had on. On the, on the site about VAR as well, but he says that he would be a fan of that. It's the direction of travel and football, and we need to be looking at it seriously to give the referees all the assistance that we can. And in a way as well, it, it kind of gives them assistance, but also makes it crystal clear. Um, it's, it's there in black and white. There's no, oh, I didn't see it. Um, it. It's right there in black and white. You can review it as many times as you like. If you still choose to willfully ignore that, it's going to be more obvious for me. Adam and I do a show on Serie A. On, a, on the Heart and Hand Patreon network and there was an incident at the weekend in VAR <laughs> that ma- made me laugh because I thought oh can you imagine that in Scotland it was Spal versus Fiorentina and uh, Spal, uh, sorry Fiorentina were attacking, they had a penalty shout, uh, the referee turned it down Spal broke and scored to go 2-1 up however VAR reviewed the penalty incident and said no that was a penalty so the ref awarded the penalty ruled out the goal that Spal had scored and Fiorentina scored the penalty. So they went from being 2-1 down to 2-1 up <laughs> over the course of about three minutes. I thought, can you imagine that in an old firm game? Imagine like 90th minute, yeah, an old firm <laughs> game. A, a, a penalty sh- I mean, I mean, uh, again, you look at it, I'm, I'm hearing Martin in the back of my head, he says, but it, it was it a penalty. It was a penalty, yeah. So <laughs> what would you like us to do? There was an infringement. It doesn't matter if you run up the park and ignore the referee and score. It was an infringement, so it has to be brought back. Yeah, no, it, it definitely was a penalty kick. So, uh, yeah, but it just it made me chuckle when I was watching it. And in terms of people say, ah, VAR kills a drama. <laughs> no, it didn't, trust me. That, no was, chance. that was three minutes, even for someone like, like myself who's got you know, no dog in that fight, but it was three minutes of just intense drama. It was absolutely wonderful. Um, a wee shout out, Adam, to the Rangers under 17s who won the Al Cass International Invitation Tournament last week in Doha with a splendid victory. Um, culminating splendid performance all through the tournament, culminating in a 9 8 penalty victory over Roma. And they walked away with the tournament, and they walked away with the player of the tournament, young Kai Kennedy. We seem to have a good bunch, but not just at that age group, but the age group above it as well. And, and hopefully, now we might be on the verge of seeing a few youngsters start to break into the side. Definitely, yeah. Kai Kennedy's one that I think we watched in the, the Glasgow Cup. Um, uh, in the summer there, and he looked very, very good uh, playing against Celtic in that. Um, he got a couple of goals, actually, in that one. But the, the standout for me at that level was, was obviously the, the, the guy, Nathan Young-Coombs, who's, who's just come in. He looks like a real find. Yeah, um, for, for a forward, certainly. We, we struggle to bring them through. We're quite good at bringing through the midfielders or, or centre-halves or, or full-backs, but we struggle to get forwards through. Um, I really thought Kieran Dixon, as well, took his goal very well. Uh, it was lovely. Uh, in the final, he again was someone who played in the Glasgow Cup that uh, caught my eye, so he looked quite good. Um, there is, you're, you're right, we, we certainly seem to be doing things well at that level. Um, we're, we're getting players up the up the divisions, up the age groups, sorry, quite well. Um, 
whether or not we can then integrate them into the, the full team is, is certainly another debate. <laughs> it's one that will never stop over, God, the 20 or 30 years that I can remember anyway, is, is if you get one or two of them into the team every two years or into the squad even, you're, you're doing very well. But certainly McCrory and, and then Middleton coming in, um, the future looks bright if we can trip feed another couple of them in. I know Dapo Mabudi and, and Josh McPake were getting spoke about this week with the, the injuries that we potentially had to Lafferty and Defoe. So the more that come through, the better for for Rangers. Yeah, definitely. And can I just say, let's not forget about Zach Rudden, who's having a terrific of course, season yeah. a very, very poor Falkirk side uh, that is not a good team he's playing for and he is their standout player. So I like him as well because he's, unlike a lot of Scottish youngsters, I was going to say our youngsters, but Scottish youngsters in general, he does have that physicality that we maybe sometimes lack. He's a big lad, um, but an athlete, uh, I think mm, I, there's an awful lot of raw material there to work with. So I'm excited for him and hopefully in the future we'll see him leading the line for the Jairs. So uh, that'll do us for today. Our apologies for discussing the, the the whole Stuart Robertson thing for that angry guy who doesn't like us to talk about the media, the, the guy that complained to us, who says that, uh, what was it, well, we're very preachy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're too preachy. But Stuart Robertson talked about it, mate. It wasn't our fault, you know. We we had to we had to bring it up. Uh, <laughs> so our apologies to that lad. But yeah, I I, I think that uh, it's going to be a big week for us. Absolutely, it didn't start promisingly, but we've got this game on Wednesday, and we really really need to win it. We will be back on Thursday with Heart and Hand Extra. And then there will be a show next week, but when it comes, I do not know because I'm in Australia. I am off to Orsa, to their convention in Auckland, and before that, I was very kindly invited by the Melbourne RSC to do a Heart and Hand show there, so I am heading off on Thursday, so there will be a show next week, whether I'm on it or not will remain to be seen, because I don't know if you guys will be up for recording at what will essentially be 4 o'clock in the morning, your time. Maybe on Saturday night, yeah, 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 well, yeah, absolutely. Whatever. I think actually, now you mentioned that one of my mates who, who lives over in Melbourne, I think I mentioned, he's actually going to be at that night. So I'll, uh, I'll tell him to come and speak to you, but not not for very long, as you no, know. Oh, he'll just, we'll, just scare me. But no, we'll record that. We'll record that, and there's your show. But uh, no, we we will definitely have something out for you next week. We'll be back on Thursday with uh, the normal heart and hand extra. Just time to remind you, if you like what you hear from us, please visit our Patreon site. It's patreon.com forward slash heart and hand. Uh, you'll get up to five shows every single day, starting at the Prince of just one ninety nine. Some great content on there. I would highly recommend Adam's. Uh, well, first of all, his Italian show, because I'm on it. But I would also recommend his tactics show, if you like that, that side of the game. Uh, he brings on tactical experts from around the world, a regular guest, Ali, who's a coach in America. And they break it down, and you learn stuff. I mean, that that's the thing, Adam. I mean, I know you do as well, that when they break it down and you think, oh, how did I miss that? And it's just, you've never been shown it. But once you see it, you begin to kind of understand things in football. And there are other matches now, not involving Rangers, I'll watch and go, all right, they're trying to do X and Y in a way that I just never realised before. Yeah, absolutely. Ali's, Ali's great at breaking it down and, like, like you said, me and you are, are laymen and he's great at, uh, I, I ask him Simplifying something. Simplifying it for us. Yeah, yeah, dumbing it down for us. Why, why do you... <laughs> Why do they do that? And he's like, well, it's because of this. And I'm like, all right, okay. And the good thing about it is Patreon has given us these guys who are, are all subscribers, like the, Ali and, and Kieran, who's coming on as well. We've had um, a couple of other guys on who, who are into tactics and working in football. And, and, well, and One of them now works at Livingston, Diggy, right? Absolutely. And they're all coming on and, and giving their views on, on the site. And it really does add a, another balance. Like you said, I'm, I'm very much just a host. Um, I, I say what I think, but I can't really articulate why it's happening. And, and Ali explains it to me in a, a nice, uh, easy way. Yeah, no, it's a good show and uh, lots and lots of other stuff there if you're into that. Just time to thank our executive producers in London, Mr. Mike Lee and Mr. Paul Miles. And to thank my guest today, the wonderful Mr. Adam Thornton. Cheers, David. Thank you. We'll be back on Thursday, folks. Hopefully we are getting ready for a trip to Pataudry. Until I speak to you then, have a great week. Cheers. Bye.